almost live from the trenches of New York City. Here are your middle-aged warriors, Chris Cimino and Rick Summers. And welcome back. Show number 51 for the Middle Age Warriors. And uh, Rick, wow. yeah, we're 51. Well, now we're in the second half of the century, beginning the century, something like that. You know how it goes. <laughs> Good anyway, luck figuring that out. We're halfway there to the Smucker's Jar, something along those lines. Yeah, something like that. But anyway, we are also in a season and a time of the year, which although it's kind of gotten adjusted like everything else has gotten adjusted because of the uh, pandemic, but uh, the award season of Hollywood, we've had the Golden Globes. We've had the SAG After Awards, but now the granddaddy, the big mom is coming up uh, April 25th, of course, the Academy Awards. And uh, our mm. special guest today is going to talk about that. And that is a friend of mine who I've known for a few years now after meeting him at the Today Show, Dave Carter. Yeah, Chris, Dave is a host on Turner Classic Movies. You know, it's embarrassing because what I think are classic movies like Slapshot, I don't think he's going <laughs> to think it's a he's classic. a little more highbrow. A little more highbrow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Even. Yeah. And um, and as you said, he's done the Today Show a couple hundred times over the years. Yeah. And he's really uh, plugged into the Hollywood scene. So I look forward to hearing some of what he has to say. A very down to earth guy. And yeah, I, there's a lot of different things going on this particular year. Uh, like I said, everything's different these days. But uh, the Academy Award is actually, uh, and they're trying to do something a little bit different than the previous awards uh, amongst the, or amidst this pandemic. So let's get I to I just today. need to ask you before we get started, uh, Dave is middle-aged warrior, right? Dave is in that territory. We're going to talk about that a little bit because when I first invited him and told him about the name of the podcast, <laughs> he was like, oh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We're going to get to that in just a second. Dave, thanks for waiting in the wings and being so patient. Welcome and thanks so much for being part of uh, Middle Age Warriors and taking yeah. out of your busy schedule. But it's great to see you. I haven't seen you in such a long time. Chris, it's been ages. It's great to see you. And Rick, really nice to meet you. My pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dave. Thanks. It's great to have you on with us. Do you fit the criteria for Middle Age Warriors? Are you Middle Age or, and are you a warrior? I would not call myself a warrior, but I would call myself middle age. In fact, when Chris uh, messaged me a couple of days ago asking if I would do this, I said, well, I just turned 48. I think that's squarely in middle age. So I yes. think so. Yeah, you're right. You're right. The sweet spot. Uh, Rick and I are past the sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, really. Sour <laughs> portion of middle age, Randy. But speaking of that, and you know, we, you've had a wonderful career. You started out at where was it uh entertainment weekly magazine weekly so magazine. i oh started God. started in the print journalism world uh actually as a summer intern in between oh. my junior and senior year of college at duke university i came back to new york where i'm from and i did a summer internship at entertainment weekly having done some journalistic exploits in high school and college uh, and i really I love and i really loved working at ew as it's known and I was lucky enough to get hired there two months after I graduated college as an my assistant. Goodness. Wow. And then I worked my way up and I stayed there for 17 years and eventually made it to senior writer level and wrote 50 plus cover stories for that magazine over wow. my stayed there. I loved I saw it. That very impressive Underachiever, huh? <laughs> very impressive list of, of, of various entertainers that you interviewed over that time. But to go back a little bit, when you were in college and then moving forward into this career and interning, is this where you wanted it to go? Did you want to stay in the entertainment field? Where did you see yourself actually going at the onset? I knew I wanted to do something involved with the entertainment world. I grew up as a kid obsessed with movies, but really music was my main passion. And I was sitting in front of MTV when it was brand new for hours <laughs> a day to the, to the point where where my parents were worried about me. Um, and then when I went to Duke in North Carolina, I would come back to New York. I'm from Westchester County, New York. I would come back to my parents' house every summer and commute into New York City for a different internship. I worked for a PR firm for a summer. I worked for MTV for a summer. But it wasn't until that third summer when I got the internship at Entertainment Weekly that I kind of had that eureka moment and I thought, this is what I want to do. Well, many sports are in full swing. Bet online, the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. The Masters is here. Bet online has you covered for all the news, scores, and odds. It's the best way to place your bets, and it's free to sign up. Head to the website, betonline.ag, that's betonline.ag, or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. 
Yeah, Dave, I'm not sure how we don't know each other because I'm from Westchester as well. Where did you grow up? Well, I saw, Rick, that you're from Dobbs Ferry, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm from Yorktown, but okay. I went to school in Tarrytown, not too far from Dobbs Ferry. Hackley? Hackley. You went to Hackley. Oh, my I goodness. Did. Good, Great private school, great lacrosse. That's what I knew because there were kids in my neighborhood that went to Ackley and played lacrosse. I had no idea what lacrosse was when I was growing up, but I just saw a bunch of guys running around like with a, 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 a basket. And, <laughs> Why do they have a basket on the end of their stick? Yeah, to catch the ball. <laughs> so now where you are, you talk about, hey, you're 48, you're a middle-aged warrior. What have you learned in terms of those years and those experiences and how you now move forward? Is there something you can reflect on and go, hey, I'm different today and I handle situations differently because of that, that you know, volume of experience you've had prior to today? Sure. I think the lesson that I learned pretty fast is that the career you start into can evolve and become something that you don't expect. When I started working at Entertainment Weekly, I thought if you wrote for the magazine, that's all you did. You didn't go on TV. But shortly after I began working there, I started going on the radio or on CNBC or, you know, kind of smaller time uh, media hits, as you would call them, if someone needed an entertainment expert to talk about what movies were opening that week or who was going to win the Oscars or whatever. And then it was through doing that that I started realizing, oh, I kind of like this part of it too. And then that, that led to a regular spot, which is the reason I know you, Chris, is it led to a regular spot on the Today Show that started 20 years ago. Oh my um, goodness. And I would occasionally see Chris in the studio or we we were on together a couple times and um but it's crazy that it's been that long. So my first Today Show spot was October of 2000. So I just had my 20th anniversary on that Oh my show. goodness. Well, congratulations. Well, I have to ask you because for all of us going through the past year and having to reinvent ourselves, and you talk about learning that, you know, what you start doing at point A is not necessarily what you're going to be doing at point Z. Um, you grew up, I'm assuming, uh, in a family with uh, maybe a dad who, who did the same thing for many, many years and earned a retirement and a pension. Is that uh, pretty much yes. the, the model you grew up with? Absolutely. I'm the child of two social workers. My parents, uh, who are still with us and still together, 50 plus years, wow. had very steady jobs and the same job throughout my entire, I mean, they're both retired now, but throughout my entire life, my mom was always a school social worker and my dad helped run the Fresh Air Fund, which is a nonprofit in New York City Absolutely. that I'm yeah. sure you guys are familiar with. So yeah, I, it didn't, I, I didn't grow up in an entertainment family by any means. And I didn't grow up in a family where people really kind of uh, toyed with different things and, right. and moved around a lot. So it really was by kind of accident that I started getting to do all these different kinds of things and and figuring out what I really enjoy doing. And that's why after 17 years of being mainly a print journalist, mm -hmm. that's when I left the magazine and tried to kind of segue over into doing on camera stuff, which led to what I'm doing now. Is there any kind of a clue you can give to people listening in on something like this? Because, you know, middle age, you start to usually reach another transitory stage in your career. Sometimes that job that you did have for 15, 20 years is suddenly gone. And and now you can't even find yourself in that same field. But for you, how do you keep yourself relevant within the field you're doing? How do you keep yourself valuable? Do you know, or is it just being Dave and people like you and they want you to keep working for them? Again, I think you'll hear me say a lot, I'm not a very calculating person, but it's it's mainly things that have happened. And then I look back and think, oh, maybe this worked out because X, Y, and Z. But over the years, I've tried as much as I can when it seems like the right fit to work for as many different outlets and companies as possible because my role can be different in each one. So for instance, when I used to go on the E! channel on Golden Globe Day or Oscar Day, I was you know, kind of the elder statesman there because I was in my 40s, whereas a lot of the hosts on E! are younger. Right. When I go on TCM, I'm one of the younger hosts. So I, I think it's good that I'm able to fill different roles in different places and then also stay relevant in the classic film world, but also stay up to date on the contemporary films too, and make sure that I'm 
you know, doing work, whether it's for IMDb or getting hired by Netflix to host a Q&A or something, making sure that I'm also keeping up to date with the stuff that's coming out now. So I'm not just this nostalgia guy. Right. Growing up in the 70s, I'm guessing, um, because don't make me do the math, because by the way, I have a background in social work, too. There you go. After, after a radio career, I left radio and went to social work, went from one side of the microphone to the other. It's like, I love it. Everybody's like, that's, that's ass backwards. You're supposed to <laughs> go the other way. But I wanted to ask you growing up, what movie really impressed you as a kid? What, what movie uh, now will you say, oh, I got to watch that because that's what I watched as a kid? Well, the, I mean, so I was born in the early 70s, but then, you know, it was I'm an 80s kid, really, right? Because okay. when the 80s started, I was seven. So Show was, off. That, that was, oh, please. So I really grew up loving the John Hughes movies. Mm. Right. 16 Candles, Breakfast Club, Some Kind of Wonderful, all of that stuff. And then as far as like a quality film, the, the first one that I really latched on to uh, from the mid 80s was Children of a Lesser God with Marley Matlin and William Hurt. And I was just very moved by that film. I remember as a college student trying to get all my friends to watch it on my VHS tape that I taped it on <laughs> HBO and nobody liked it except me. But uh, that's that's a movie that I still have on my DVR. And if if I there's a scene near the end uh, that I really like that I'll just kind of play every once in a while. It makes yeah. me feel good. Here's something you didn't know about me. Yeah. I don't sleep well. <laughs> maybe, well, maybe you did know that about me. <laughs> but I'm really good at staying awake and staring at my ceiling. I've become an expert. I know every crack ah. and crevice. It's great. So I'm always looking for new ways to get my you-know-what together. My head hits the pillow, and bam, my mind just starts racing to what I didn't do, what I need to do, yada, yada, yada. You guys relate to that? Yeah. Probably, yeah. Right there with you, man. It kind of sucks. Fortunately, though, I found Sunday Scaries, and I realized they make products specifically for overthinkers and night owls like me. Sunday Scary CBD gummies help me decompress, ah. clear my head, ah. and fall asleep so I can actually wake up a fully functioning human being and annoy my girlfriend by snoring all night. <laughs> me too. Here you go. Wait, you're there with us? You're annoying my girlfriend snoring all night? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. Anyway, there's no risk to buy. The company offers a 100% lifetime money-back guarantee. Now, if the product's not for you, that's okay. You'll get your money back. Sunday Scaries in this, is in the uh, stress-relieving business, not the stress-causing business. I got you 25% off to prove that. You visit sundayscaries.com. That's sundayscaries, S-C-A-R-I-E-S for the scaries, dot com, and use my promo code BLEAV, B-L-E-A-V, for your discount. That's promo code B-L-E-A-V for 25% off at sundayscaries.com. They're really amazing, and you won't regret joining their squad. I'm stressed out because I can't spell. In terms of the classic films, though, when you were younger, what was the first one that you were exposed to and said, hey, I really have to go back and look into some of these things because these are amazing films. That happened to me early on in my time at Duke. I took uh, a couple of film classes. And the first one, of course, was like a film introduction class. And the professor had us watch Laura with uh, Gene Tierney and Dana Andrews. Um, which is just a great romantic murder right. mystery. It's just fantastic. Um, so that was the one where I, that was probably the gateway to classic film for me. And then we watched, you know, Citizen Kane and right. Buster Keaton's Seven Chances and movies like that. But I think Laura was the one that I really latched on to. You know, as a kid growing up, going to the movies was really, it was a treat. And it was also a built-in first date when you were trying to meet somebody. And um, if you can take me through your history of going to the movies back then, do you remember what it was like going to the movies as a teenager back in the 70s and 80s? Sure. We, it was the multiplex, uh, yeah. Rick, in, in Hawthorne. Right off oh, yeah. 133 or wherever that was. Oh, yeah. And that that was and that was like a new movie theater at the time when I was Absolutely. Uh, a teenager. I wasn't dating as a teenager, but I would go with like my packs of friends. And I I mean I have a vivid memory of going to the movies. I think we watched Nightmare on Elm Street three, ah. or three of us. And then we left and snuck back in to watch, I think it was some kind of wonderful. And we did like this, <laughs> this illicit double feature. And I remember thinking I was just being so naughty, uh, sneaking into the second film, oh, yeah. but it, but it was great. 
you know, when you said that about the multiplex, I remember that, and that was like one of the, that's when that door was open, so to speak, that you can sometimes find a way to watch two films or three films, you know, so, so to speak, for the price of one. Right. But I feel like, I don't know, do you feel like you missed out on, there was more of a, uh, of a romanticizing of the event of going to these old movie houses. I can barely remember, you know, when I was probably, I caught the tail end of that. It was a big theater called the Valencia. It was in, in Queens. And I can remember walking in and, you know, it was all velvet red and, and there's this huge dome ceiling. And it just, it was like mini, every theater was like a mini version of Radio City Music Hall. Did you ever get a chance to get into some of those theaters? Never. Yeah. I mean, I, now that I work for TCM, we have a big film festival, uh, well, in the in the pre-times, we would have it uh, in person in LA and we would take over some of these classic theaters. And sometimes with a silent film, we'll bring an orchestra in and wow. and that kind of brings you back to that time. But no, it, as a kid, I, I didn't. And, and because I was more of a TV kid and a music kid, I was not one of these people who was watching watching the old movies, you know, late at night, I was watching HBO and watching some of the more right. current stuff, as opposed to the classics. So I came to the classics on a later side, not until I was in college. It's weird to think that you essentially grew up at about the time MTV was born in 82. You said you were born a little bit before that. But so you've pretty much not known adult life without MTV. And I remember back in 82, when I was and Chris and I were kids, uh, when MTV was born, what that was like. And I was studying television radio at the time. And um, I remember getting out and some of my classmates ended up going to work for Viacom in New York City, right there in Times Square. And uh, the building I ended up working at, I worked at a radio station that was in that building. And uh, MTV was uh, in the building. And it was the coolest thing. Of course, I it aged out way by then, but it was really cool. What did you watch as a kid growing up? MTV. I mean, I'll, I have I have other answers for you too, but I'll just tell you one quick thing, which is that I was watching so much MTV, and let's remind people this is when MTV was actually videos, okay? Right. It wasn't, yeah. It wasn't yeah. Osborns or anything. Every this is pathetic, but it's also kind of impressive, I guess. Every video that came on, as soon as it came on, I could look at it and say and recite the artist, the song, the album, and the record label, which is those wow. four little lines in the five seconds before it actually popped up on the screen. And did you, alert. Did you phrase it in the form of a question? <laughs> <laughs> with, 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 that that mind, with that in mind, so give me your top, off the top of your head, your, your top three all-time music videos, which really aren't that big. Oh, anymore. that's a great question, Chris. Well, the ones that really bring me back are the ones from the early days of MTV. So there's a song I love called Save It For Later, which is by the English Beat. Um, and that's in this great kind of Parisian restaurant uh, setting, which I absolutely love. Another one that takes me back big time is Man on a Man on the Corner by Genesis, which is just a very simple video of just Phil Collins and the one. band yeah. singing, but that one really takes me back a lot. And then maybe Mexican Radio by Wall of Voodoo. You oh, guys remember that song? Mexican Radio. Um, radio, right. That one, yeah. And there's like a scene where someone's head comes out of a, a oh. barrel of beans. Like there's a lot yes, of really cool imagery that, that. <laughs> that was no, effective. Dave, me. I was working in Top 40 Radio when Thriller came out. And oh my God, how that took the world. And Michael Jackson uh, was in concert at the time. And it was just, it was surreal. I mean, it was mm. bigger than life. That was a video that yeah. made it almost, it was like a mini, you know, movie, so to speak, if you will. I mean, it's that was true. Huge produced. Before but we to answer your question, the, oh, yeah. no, sorry, Chris, to answer your question, what else was I watching? Family Ties. Family Ties, <laughs> Cosby Show. I was like that whole block of NBC sitcoms, right. you know, Cheers, all of that. But then as a younger kid, I was watching, you know, Silver Spoons and the, the Hogan family, Valerie Harper, all that. that kind oh, of stuff. yeah. That's what I really like. So before we get into the, the main current event that I really we wanted to pick your brain about a little bit, of course, the uh, 93rd uh, Academy Awards coming up. All of those, I saw some of the, the list of people you interviewed when you were in print, and you've interviewed people since then, obviously, uh, since your TV career. Do you have a particular favorite interview or with somebody that you never thought you would get? And wow, here I am actually talking to this person. 
Sure. So the I have an answer for each of those. The, my favorite person to interview has always been and still is George Clooney. He he's the he's the best. I actually did five cover stories on him when I was at Entertainment Weekly over the years, and we've stayed in touch. And I've uh, spent some time with him more recently as well. He's so great. Any question you ask him, he gives you like a funny answer, and then he mm -hmm. gives you a serious answer. And you can, if it's a print interview, you can kind of take your pick. Um, and if it's a live in-person interview in front of an audience, he gets the audience laughing right. with the funny answer, and then he gives a serious answer. Um, and I had some crazy experiences with him where one time when I was living in New York, I flew to LA to interview him, and I went right from the airport in my rental car to the photo shoot that we were doing for the article. And then the plan was that after the photo shoot was over, he and I were gonna have lunch and do the interview. So I'm waiting for him to be done with the photo shoot. He finishes, he goes, okay, Dave, let's have lunch. Um, do you have a car? And I said, <laughs> I do, but don't you have yours? He goes, why don't you drive us? So I, before I know it, I'm driving George Clooney down Santa Monica Boulevard in Los <laughs> Angeles to the restaurant that he's chosen, thinking to myself, this better not be the day that I get into a yes, car accident you know yeah. with the world's most famous man and then we get to the restaurant and i have to parallel park with uh him in the car which oh. he, luckily there was a big big spot so that was okay so that was crazy but then to answer your question of someone who i never expected i would have a experience with uh well there's two the, the first one and i know chris this is meaningful to you because you're a fan but the first one would be elton john because he was uh he has always been fairly press shy and uh, he agreed to do an interview with me for Entertainment Weekly. Uh, and I went to Las Vegas and spent an afternoon with him and, and really hit it off with him, which was great. And we've remained friends to this day, which is, which is yeah. very exciting. And then the other one real quick is Angelina Jolie, who also very rarely does interviews. Mm -hmm. And I was in the Cannes Film Festival covering there and, and the cover of Entertainment Weekly had dropped out um, that week and they needed a replacement cover. So they got Angelina Jolie to agree to do an interview. So I interviewed her and we had lunch and she ate a steak and <laughs> we, got, we got photographed by the paparazzi and they, it was this, this whole crazy thing. So that was a, a very bizarre. You could have been her new squeeze. Exactly. I've got a question for you because I want to take it on, uh, on the other side of the coin, an interview you would like to forget. Well, that's easy. Okay. So I, I was, uh guest hosting access hollywood mm -hmm. and uh the the morning version of access hollywood which is the hour-long version where you just have you know you can be anybody that that's coming on and one of the guests that day was teresa judice who's one of the real housewives of oh New yeah Jersey, the one who went to jail mm -hmm. <laughs> um and at, at at the time she and her husband ex-husband now had both been convicted Right. of i believe tax fraud was the was the charge he was in jail and then she, uh there was talk that he was going to be deported uh to italy which he eventually was and i asked a question to her it was a satellite interview i was in la she was in new york and i asked a question as to whether she was worried that this was going to be the end of the family unit as she knew it in her life and she did not enjoy that question and uh, stormed off the, oh. the set and it yeah. went viral. And I thought to myself, really? I mean, after spending a, over a decade, you know, trying to build a reputation for myself as, you know, the person who interviews Oscar nominees and Oscar winners, right. that this is going to be the interview that people will know. Really? And it's, it's, it's died down, but it was for like a week. It was all yeah. people were talking <clears throat> about, at least when they were talking to me. Believe me, it I was know, mortifying. I know a little bit about that feeling. <clears throat> no, oh yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but, but going back, you know, it's funny, you mentioned George Clooney and Jeffrey Lyons, who was a movie critic for uh, WNBC in New York for many, many years. And in the same studio that we did the news, he would do his, he had a little half hour show. Sure. And George was a couple of times guest and George was from Cincinnati where I had worked. So we would just get in this guy, you know, I was just introduced to him and suddenly we engaged in this very comfortable, natural conversation. He is a very cool guy, no matter what, you know, he's a big Hollywood the star, best. but there's something very charming, very genuine about him. And the Elton John thing, I had the opportunity to interview him when he was opening up a Tower Records, remember those, mm -hmm. <laughs> time, in, in Lincoln Center. And that was just an amazing experience. But to speak about Elton, to go I forward. I have a question so for you, Chris. What are records? Exactly. And he was <laughs> buying them because that was his big thing. He every, I guess it was every Tuesday new releases used to come out. I believe that was the day. And, and he would always stock up. But my son, fast forward, 
who is now 30 years old working for Apple Music. And he was an engineer and he had to go out. Elton was in Las Vegas and he has his Apple radio show that he's a DJ on once a week. Great show, by the way, if anybody wants to- Rocket Hour. On Apple Music, yeah, it's really, the Rocket Hour is excellent. And so my son's across the table, Elton's not there yet. And whoever the person helping out brings, puts a plate down on the side where Elton would be sitting and it's a bagel but it, it is blackened, it is burnt to beyond almost recognition. And my son's like, oh crap, he's gonna sit down, he's gonna see this bagel, he's gonna freak, and now I gotta deal with all of the fallout. Elton walks in, sits down. First he tells my son his name is not Samino, it's Chimino, which I'm like, hey, if Elton wants to correct it, that's fine with me. And he looks at the bagel and he goes, hmm, perfect. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that kind of ended the whole thing and diffused everything. But uh, it, it is a really funny thing when you meet people, you have expectations and, and things that just sometimes blow you away at how comfortable and real. It's like, hey, wait a minute. They're just, they're just like me. And we're having a conversation about their art and what they do. And it's, it's pretty awesome. But I think somebody like you, you just come across as a very uh, natural, comforting. You're, you're not putting on any type of show. This is you and you're trying to get out of them something that might be valuable to a view or something interesting to a view. And I think you that's why you're still doing this, by the way, Dave, if you needed me to tell you. <laughs> well, I appreciate that very much because you've completely encapsulated exactly what I try to do. Yeah. Um, so if that comes across, then great. No, you bring a lot of warmth. Absolutely. Uh, it reminds me, Chris, I don't know if you know this story that uh, my wife, Valerie, was interviewing Tony Bennett and uh in his apartment in new york and uh he had offered this is such a great story uh i should let her tell it but she's not here right now um he was a great painter as you know and she was complimenting his paintings and he said darling take one of the paintings please and valerie was like no mr bennett thank you i so appreciate that oh. i've re I, I i wouldn't feel right doing that no darling you got to take one of the pictures please it would be my honor no mr bennett thank you so much fast forward now 25 years later or however many it is and she's like damn i wish i took one of those pictures Miss that on a da vinci yeah <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> all right so let's let's it. get to the present I, I don't want to keep you here for every day but i appreciate your patience um 93rd academy awards originally supposed to be february 28th it's going to be april 25th now they're doing something that relative to the past award shows have had to do there is apparently no zoom what i'm understanding is that this is all kind of now in flux but uh -huh. yes originally the producers of the show put out a statement saying if you want to accept your Oscar, you got to come to LA and we're going to have a socially distant show. Part of it's going to be in the Dolby Theater where it always is. Part of it's going to be at Union Station in downtown LA, but there's no Zooming. You can't Zoom in your acceptance speech. Well, there was some pushback there from a lot of the international nominees, particularly who said, wait a second, we can't get on a plane and fly to LA. That's not, the timing is not right. So my understanding is, well, first of all, there's going to be a, a London gathering now, and I think a Paris gathering for people oh. who can't make it to LA. But I don't even think that's going to uh, encompass everybody. I think they're going to have to, in some cases, I would imagine, have a handful of remote uh, winners. But they, they clearly don't want that because they want people in person. They, they, that makes it much more exciting. And the award shows that have happened this season so far, the ratings have been dismal because mm -hmm. they're not the same. You know, they're, there's, they're, they don't have the red carpets. They don't have the kind of conviviality that a lot of award shows are supposed to have. So I think it's going to be a, a similar thing, but hopefully they can work around it. Where are you going to be positioned to, uh, for this? Um, well, it's funny because for the first time in, I couldn't even tell you when, I'm going to get to be at home oh. sitting on the sofa watching the Oscars because I have a show that I'm hosting for IMDb, but that's going to be that earlier that day, mm -hmm. I have nothing happening as of now during the Oscars or be right before or right after, aside from a podcast that I'm gonna do with Melissa Rivers afterwards. Mm -hmm. So um, so no, I actually am gonna get to oh. sit and enjoy the Oscars like a, a regular viewer for the first time in a very long time. Yeah. Dave, can you do me a favor and just tell um, our listeners here at Middle Age Warriors, and by the way, let's remind them you're listening to Chris and Rick on the Believe Podcast Network. And our special guest is Dave Carter, who is just shedding a lot of light on the whole Hollywood scene and the Oscar scene for us. Can you tell us 
where they might be able to catch your pre-show IMDb show online? Yes. Yeah, so on April 25th, the, the Oscar Sunday, uh, that afternoon, three o'clock Eastern, noon Pacific, I will be co-hosting an Oscar preview show um, with Garcelle Beauvais, who actually is an actress from Coming to America. And she's actually one of the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. So I'm going back to the Real Housewife theme, but she's <laughs> terrific. <careful. laughs> and yeah, and uh, we'll be kind of breaking down the Oscars and talking about what people can expect. And then also people should know that all month long in April, in April on Turner Classic Movies, where the other place I work, we're showing just Oscar nominated and Oscar winning films. So I'm on every Saturday afternoon and every Monday night. Awesome. I look forward to seeing you. It's, it's nice to see your mug again because it's kind of in the midst of all this. We lost you a little bit, but so it's nice to be back. Before we run out of time, I'm looking at my, you know, we have we have the cheapo version of Zoom, so I'm down to nine and a half minutes. So let's, the get, version. So let's get through, uh, let's get through all this. Now I've only seen, I think about five or six of the movies that, you know, that are out there that are big. Let's go with picture of the year. Uh, Nomadland, uh, The Trial of the Chicago Seven, Minari, Promising Young Woman, Sound of Metal. That's what I've seen. What do you think is the odds on favor for this? Nomadland, I think, is going to win. It's a movie that has gotten a lot of acclaim. It stars Frances McDormand as a woman who's kind of living out of her van and having this nomadic existence. It's on Hulu, available for people to watch. But it's just gotten a ton of uh, awards leading up to the Oscars. I think there's other movies that are close, like Minari and The Trial of the Chicago 7, or maybe Judas and the Black Messiah. My personal favorite is Sound of Metal, which is on Amazon. Yep. But uh, but Nomadland is a gorgeous film and, and a film that really speaks to today. I think it's going to win. And to go to you know Sound of Metal, and you know there's a there's a, a very unique scenario this year with Chadwick Boseman up for Best Actor, obviously, and, and he was amazing. Uh, that was Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, correct? Yes. And you know the performance in uh, it's Riz Ahmed was in uh, I guess uh, the Sound of Metal, right? He was up for Best Actor. Yep. He's. What he do is. you think in, in terms of? I mean, I have a feel. I mean, everybody seems to think that Chadwick uh, Boseman will, of course, win posthumously, but. Uh, I, I think that performance also, though, by Riz was amazing. I agree. I thought Riz Ahmed was phenomenal in Sound of Metal. Anthony Hopkins is also terrific in this movie called The Father, which people are just beginning to see because it only recently came out. Um, but Chadwick Boseman, it's, uh, yes, he, it is posthumous. It will be posthumous, just like Peter Finch for Network uh, back in the 70s. But it's not... Uh, it's not a pity vote. It, right, it's a right. very deserved win if and when it happens. It's an electrifying performance. But yeah, it'll be a bittersweet moment for sure. I'm going to put you on the spot and just ask you your favorite movie of all time. I have two. Lost in Translation is my contemporary favorite with Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson. And my classic favorite is All About Eve. Hmm. Okay. I, I guess mean, my slap shot and Caddyshack don't fit in there anywhere. No, right? you, well, he's very high <laughs> brow, Rick. You could tell. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, let's roll through. Uh, how about Best Actress? Who do you think? Is it Viola Davis or what do you think? Yeah, it's it's a bit up for grabs, I think, between Viola Davis and maybe Carrie Mulligan for a promising young she woman. Was, she if was amazing, she was great. So great. If Viola Davis wins, she becomes the first black actress ever to win two Oscars because she won for Fences right. a few years right. ago. So that would be a, a lovely moment. Frances McDormand's also up for that, who, you know, as far as I'm concerned, she could read a, a you know, a toothpaste to me and I'll say, wow, that was the most amazing read of toothpaste I've ever seen. It's true. But the, what's good to remember is that Frances McDormand is one of the producers of Nomadland. Wow. So if Nomadland wins Best Picture, Frances McDormand wins her third Oscar. So I think a lot of the wow. voters know that. And that's why they're going to vote for Viola or Carrie Mulligan instead. Do you have any Best Supporting Actor uh, ideas? Best Supporting Actor is pretty sewn up. If, if, if there's a lock, it's uh, in that category for Daniel Kaluuya, who plays Fred Hampton of the Black Panthers in Judas and the Black Messiah. It's his second nomination. He was nominated a couple of years ago for the movie Get Out, and he's just swept um, all of the awards. And by the way, I should mention that there's a very good chance that for the first time ever, all four of the acting awards could be won by performers of color because yeah. you have Chadwick Boseman and right. Viola Davis and Daniel Kaluuya. And then just to segue to supporting actress, one of the top contenders is this Korean actress named Yoo Jung Yoon, who plays the grandma in Minari. And I think she's kind of the front runner right now. I did. See well, if that were the case, that would certainly turn a lot of the naysayers on their keister. Uh, if that happens. And uh, I guess we'll all be watching not too far down the road to see that it does. Yeah, it's, True. 
it's, it's obviously it's about time. It's just a matter of, I think, also, you know, opening up spectrums and opening up our eyes a little bit wider and, and the Academy doing doing the same thing. But I, I just want to I watched last night uh, the trial of the Chicago Seven. That entire ensemble was amazing to me. I mean, the, everybody, you name it, whoever, I don't care if somebody's sitting behind somebody in, in the jury box, it, like everybody was amazing. I was blown away by that whole story and the performances of everyone. I don't know. It, I agree. Movie, movie? Yeah, I, I think, um, well, you saw that movie just won the Best Ensemble Award at the Screen Actors Guild uh, mm -hmm. the other day, which is the perfect award for that movie because that's truly what that is. And I think what you've got there is a combination of these amazing actors, younger and older, you know, whether it's Eddie Redmayne all the way up to Michael Keaton and Frank Langella uh, and, or Sasha Baron Cohen doing something that we've never seen him do, plus mixed with the brilliant words of Aaron Sorkin, he's just able able to do something where these actors can really sink their teeth into it and and show off what they can do that the writing has such energy to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what gives the film all of the life that it has. Yeah, I was shaking my head through the whole thing. It was just spellbinding and 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 just the performances were mind blowing to me out of so yep. many people on the screen. It just they just never missed a beat. Obviously, my dog agrees. Tula. <laughs> on that note, and moving forward for you as things get hopefully back to what, you know, I'll again, put the fake parentheses around them and well, air quotes, I should say, back to normal. What are you looking forward to most as we come out of the pandemic? Film festivals. Mm. Usually in a, in a given year, I'm at the Telluride Film Festival, Toronto, Cannes, and they're, they have such a great vibe and spirit to them. And there's always, you know, filled with interesting filmmakers and actors to interview and talk to. So yeah, award shows, I'm excited for that too, but really a film festival to me yeah. is kind of my happy place. So I'm really hopeful the the one that I'm hoping is gonna kick it off and, and be like the first air quotes normal film festival would be the Telluride Film Festival, which is always Labor Day. So my fingers are crossed that by Labor Day, hopefully if maybe they require vaccines or whatever they do, um, they're able to have people convene in that kind of a setting. How about just sitting in a theater with a big thing of popcorn with that fake butter on it? Yeah. I don't think Dave does that for some reason. I'm just thinking. <laughs> I do. I, I, we are spoiled, those of us in the media who cover films, because oftentimes we go to like a private screening room or whatever. I mean, the, the movie going experience has become less and less enjoyable over the years just because yeah. there's people on their phones or, you know, chatting throughout the movie or texting. It's like, oh, so yeah. I don't know what it's going to be like then when people start being able to do it again. I should hope they'll have a little bit more respect for the experience. And I love the, the sticking shoes experience. That's, you know, who can, you know come on, I, I miss that. And wondering <laughs> what it is exactly my shoe is sticking. To. But anyway, on that note, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for stopping by. And I wish you nothing but the best moving forward. You come back to the East Coast. Let's try to get together. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get to see each other face to face. Yeah, it'd be great to see you. I would love it. Great to see you guys. And Chris and I will take you out for lunch, won't we, Chris? Well, Rick will. Done. I mean, uh, all right, if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> all right, be good, Dave. Thanks, guys. Take care, pal. Well, that was interesting, but I got to tell you, you know, I haven't seen any of the movies, so I'm so glad that you asked some of the questions because I think <laughs> you're a lot more adept than I am. Well, th this was for some reason, you know, last few years belonging to SAG after Union, we get to see some of these movies uh, and right. we have to, we're voting. But uh, this year I was kind of sluggish in getting to them. I don't know why, but maybe it's just the whole mood of things. But I did I did see about six of them and I, I really was was very moved by the Chicago 7 trial movie. That, for some reason, that entire cast just blew me away. But uh, there's some good stuff out there and you can find, you know, you have to search around because some of these movies are on Hulu. Some of them are on Netflix. Some of them, you know, you have to sort of download from somewhere else. So it's a different world than where we find movies. They're not just in theaters anymore. But uh, Dave was great and gave us some insight as to uh, what this year is going to look like. And I yeah. see they're still wavering from no Zoom to now using some Zoom on the Academy Awards. Uh, hopefully next year at this time when we're talking about it, we're back to a normal, if you will, with whatever that we may be. We shall more see. More people have seen movies. Once again, it was great to have you stop by our weekly uh, Believe Podcast reality check middle-aged warriors here on the Believe Podcast Network. Is that what we call it? But anyway, tell your friends. Please join us next time around. Uh, again, go back to some of the older shows. We've had some great guests along the way. And if you haven't noticed by now this show, how it was conceived, it was over many, many glasses of wine and many, many years. <laughs> and uh, it is produced at the Semino Studios. That's our New York City office. And I do a little The New York City office. 
Who's our announcer, though? Our announcer is Valerie Smaldone. Our show has been engineered by Chris. Nicely done, I might add. Yeah, thank you. And our catering, do you want to announce the catering? Catering catering is provided by uh, Samino's, uh, Summers uh, at times, and DeJesus. So uh, it's it's multifaceted. You wouldn't believe some of the food that we serve at this show. It's just phenomenal. Absolutely. Any any reproduction, now this is where I get stuck, because this is like the baseball disclaimer. Any reproduction without the express written consent of Samino Summers Productions is prohibited by law, I think. I, I don't know if it's prohibited by say, law. No, it's not. I don't know whose law that is. Uh, but anyway. Until next time. Uh, I'm out of here. Sunshine always. Stay well. Stay safe. We'll see you soon. Be good. Feel good. I'm Rick Summers. He's Chris Amino, And we're out of here. Middle Age Warriors presented by Bet Online. I thought we were out of here. I'm laying down another 25, 50 bucks that the Mets are not going to win the World <laughs> <Okay. game. laughs> Hey, if you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and rate the show on iTunes, preferably five stars, no begging. Uh, We're available also on your favorite directories, iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, Luminary, and TuneIn. You can find us at Believe.com, that's B-L-E-A-V.com, and at Believe Podcasts. 